Hello. Uh, let me start with how we started this project. So as many of you already know, gaze tracking is a big enabling technology for VR and AR. And we have been hearing many interesting talks about using gaze as a new input modality. And by reading gaze, we can understand what people think or, or feel. And I, I don't think I have to mention everything that more applications will be possible by having gaze tracking working inside VR and AR. It's also a very friendly environment for doing gaze tracking. So you just insert a small camera inside the headset and you can get this image. And what gaze estimation does is to associate this image with one gaze direction. But this example here is very friendly example. What you actually encounter in real application is more difficult. So for example, the person can have long eyelashes drooping and you can occlude the view of pupil and iris, which are important features for doing gaze tracking. And some people have small eye openings. Just to be clear, this person is not being sleepy. And many people wear glasses, and these create very strong reflections on glasses surfaces. And I often wear my glasses downward, and then that can, the, the glasses frame can actually occlude uh, pupil and iris. There's also inbuilt complexity in our eye. For example, as your pupil constricts, it moves to up and, and toward the nose. And many gaze tracking algorithms base on pupil location. So this pupil center shift is known to cause about up to five degrees of error in worst cases. So we thought maybe this is something a neural network can do well because we, we know that it's accurate and robust for some kind of image processing uh, problems. But we need data that's large and that covers all the variations. So we, we know that there are many existing data sets, but we notice that we are very interested in specific one configuration that's near eye configuration using infrared light. So it looks like we need to create data sets ourselves. So these are what we did. The first two are about data sets. So the first thing is a rendered synthetic data set that's anatomically accurate. And we borrowed one model that's already existing and modified it to, to suit for our use cases that's near eye configuration. And the second was capturing real data set specifically for near eye configuration. And then the third is training a neural network to do gaze-related tasks. So let me start with the synthetic data set. So our data set is based on one excellent prior art that's synthesized eyes created by Wood and colleagues. But we modified the geometry and material property of that model to more accurately reflect properties that are important for near eye gaze estimation. We rendered two million images in total and was in high resolution. And each image comes with labels of gaze direction and eye location with respect to the camera and pupil location in the image and pixel accurate region labels. So let's take a close look at the changes. So the top image is one sample image from Synthes eyes. As you can see, it's rendered for visible light. So it has material properties for red, green, and blue light. But what's more commonly used in near eye gaze estimation is infrared light. So we apply the changes for infrared light. The second thing we noticed was uh, the shape of the eyeball, which, is, which becomes important for near eye gaze estimation. So here you might notice the size of the iris with respect to the eye opening is slightly larger than, than the image in the bottom. So we adjusted the eyeball size and also applied small changes to more closely reflect the average shape of the eye, human eye. Then the third thing was the animation that does uh, pupil center shift as the uh, pupil size changes. So we know that as pupil shrinks more, it, it moves toward the, the nose and, and up and we parameterize that motion so that you can modify it to if you want to include some individual variations. Then the last thing is pixel accurate region labels. And notice that we also provide region labels for 
the regions that are occluded by the skin too. So this is the example. It blinks, and we can change the gaze direction, and notice the glint shape and location is correctly calculated based on physics law. And we, you can also change the intensity of each region independently. So in total, we rendered two million synthetic images using Blender. And the render engine was Cycles. It's a path tracer that calculates reflection and refraction accurately based on physics law. But when we looked, uh, compared this synthetic image we rendered to the real images we captured, there were differences in terms of image characteristics. For example, these microscopic bumps you can see in the skin, it's not really visible in the, in the real images. And also the details on the iris is more blurred in real images. So this is where our region label can come handy. So you can apply various operations such as contrast scaling, blurring, and Gaussian noising. You can do it either globally or you can do it separately for each region to create something that looks more similar to real images. So you first do pre-processing like this and then feed it to the training pipeline. So now let me cover the real captured data set. So our real data set consists of one million infrared images, binocular, and it's the highest resolution among all the available real data set. And each image comes with a label of gaze direction. And it's worth to note that this is the first data set that involves accurate task that is to ensure accurate gaze direction control, and also it reduces fixational eye movements, which is unconscious eye jitter that happens all the time. And we also systematically control the intensity of the scene the viewer is looking at to induce pupil size change. So the pupil center shift is included in our data set. So one thing we wanted to have, but what we couldn't have in, in, the, in our data set was the pupil iris sclera skin region label. But there is one excellent work that I want to point out here. Just to be clear, this is not what we did. I'm, I'm just pointing out because this is important. Please check out Open EDS for more information about region labeling in real data. So this is the setup we used to capture real data. So you can see the part of the glasses frame prototype. And we placed infrared LEDs for the places that we normally do for uh, near eye gaze estimation. And on the right figure, you can see the infrared camera looking up. And there's two circular plates that are infrared mirrors. It reflects infrared light. So for the infrared cameras, it's looking our eyes straight on, but the viewer is looking at the screen directly. So let's see what the viewer sees on the screen per recording of each gaze direction. So first, we start with white screen. This will constrict the viewer's pupil because the pupil uh, shrinks, shrinks in size when see the bright uh, light. So we wait long enough to, until the pupil becomes two to three millimeters in, in diameter. And then we present one target at the desired gaze direction. And the viewer has to report the orientation of this letter. The letter was small, so the viewer could correctly respond only if the, the viewer is directly looking at the target. So if viewer gives wrong response, we didn't start the recording. Instead, we presented another target. And finally, the viewer gets the correct answer. Then we started the recording. And we varied the intensity of infrared LED to include the variations of various uh, signal to noise uh, ratios in, in, in the camera sensor. And soon after, we made the background screen black. So responding to this intensity change, the pupil will start to grow. So here's one video for one gaze direction. And finally, let me talk about the neural network we trained with by using this data. 
So I'll talk about pupil localization in this talk, but you can find other examples in our paper too. So our network architecture was inspired by this work done by Lane and colleagues. It's on facial expression detection. So the input to the network was a picture of a person's face. The output was the locations of 5,000 vertices in the face mesh. So we thought this is a good candidate for gaze estimation because the network was good at accurately and robustly detect the, the local position change and orientation, orientation change of each part of the face. So this is uh, the specifics about our, our network. It's seven layers of convolutional neural networks and each layer was followed by smaller but deeper convolutional layer and after the seven convolutional layers, there was a one fully connected layer. We evaluated this network performance on PupilNet data set. And as you can see, the position of the eye, eye image and, and the size of the eye, um, they are all different in, in uh, each individual photo and it's sometimes overlaid with random reflection. So we included these variations in our training data by augmenting our images. So this is an example of our augmentation done on one single image. So we were translating or applying 2D rotation or overlaying a random image on top of our image. This shows the inference performance of our network green dot is ground truth and the red dot is the inference results through our network. And for most cases, it's pretty robust and accurate for pupil location, finding the, the center of the pupil. And you can also see it's robust for the, the dif different appearance of the eyes, also illumination change of, of the capturing environment. This plot per, uh, compares performance of various pupil localization algorithms, and each color represents different pupil localization algorithm. And it shows distribution because PupilNet data set has many different scenarios. So it's a spread of detection rate across different scenarios. Orange represents our network, and it's doing quite well, but it's not doing the best. But I want to point out that this network was very small. So the size of network was about eight megabytes compared to the, the two CBF 20 and CBF 15 required about 9.5 gigabyte and three gigabyte of memory. And the network was also very fast too. So when we measured the speed of executing this network, it was running below one millisecond for desktop GPU and this time was including the data transfer from CPU to GPU and then GPU inference and coming back to CPU. It was also fast on mobile GPU too. So when we ran it on Jetson TX2, it was running, uh, uh, finishing the operation in 3.781 millisecond. So as a conclusion, we are, are providing a rendered data set but that's based on previous data set and we modified it so that we can closely uh, reflect the actual anatomy of human eyes that are important for near eye configuration. And we share real data set that's specifically captured in near eye configure geometrical configuration. And we show one example in, in this talk that's light and accurate and robust for detecting where the pupil is in the image. And there are more examples in our paper too. But there are some works to be done and, and we couldn't cover all the problems. For example, we can model the rotation of the eyeball and also dynamic deformation of the eye when we change gauges. Gauges, But yeah, that's for future work. Thank you for your attention and you can find more about our work in this link. Thank you. Um, so if you have any question, please raise your hand and one of the SPs will make sure to bring a microphone. Or come here. 
Um, thank you, uh, Rolf Vertigal, Human Media Lab. <clears throat> what you seem to be doing is, is simply uh, finding the pupil center, is that right? So, the yeah. red dot is just the pupil center. The example I, I showed in this talk was yeah. just finding pupil center. Yeah. We also did end-to-end -end case tracking, but I didn't mention it in this talk, but you can find it in the paper. Yeah, because, you know, finding sort of a black circle in an image like that is fairly easy. You don't necessarily need a neural network for that. But to map the pupil center to an accurate location outside, in the outside world, is really the challenge, right? That, that's true. But, but in this example, uh, we actually have, so yeah, so finding pupil center in simple images is, is, is very simple, but we have very many challenging cases too. For example, when the eyelid is almost covering the pupil, you have only like one third of the circle and we have to find the right. pupil center there too. And, and, and so how, is, how did the algorithm perform on that kind of challenge? Yeah, so I actually have an example image. I, yeah, let me show that to you. Just a moment. I have a lot of slides. Ooh, so that's, let me that's a nice slide. It. I like that slide. I also like your background. Thank you. It is. <laughs> Does that change with the day, uh, the time of day? No. <laughs> Um, this moment, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so this is one example. So you can see the red dots that those are still the inference yeah, yeah, points. Yeah, yeah. And these are very strong reflections. Right. So y you're right. If, if it's not having these challenge variations, then, then finding pupil center is very easy. But we want to so, do that so even when- this is when the real contribution here. Sorry? This is the real contribution here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually removed this slide this morning because I was, I, I was trying to be in 15 minutes, but yeah. So for example, here, it's finding pupil center. It, it's inaccurate because it's very difficult case, but still pretty close to the, the ground truth. Okay, one more quick question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. It's really nice. So um, you know that there are always a saying that the visual axis is not the same as the optical axis, and how do you render that, uh, how that is handled in your rendering system? And second question is also related, since we can't observe the real direction of the gaze, how about just train the neural network to train directly figure out where they are looking at like the real gaze direction instead of like figuring out the pupil center, for example. And what's the thinking there? Thank so you. So for the, the offset, we just added one parameter that rotates eyeball with respect to the optical axis. So we, we set it to five degrees in our model. But if, if you want to use that model, you can change that value, then, then it will reflect the change. And for the second question, I guess you are asking about end-to-end -end gaze tracking. So uh, when trained, we just feed the gaze direction as the output and, and calculate loss function. That's, that's all we do. But it, it, it is definitely more challenging work. And our performance was just slightly better than the state of the arts. <laughs>